Tauraranga, Poa Te Whakaaro, Poa Te Tangata, Poa Te Aroha, Te Pau e here nei i a tātou. Mauri ora ki a tātou, haumie, huie, tāikie. May clarity be yours, may understanding be yours. Through reflection, through personal endeavour, through respect, the virtues which bind us as one. May, may we be filled with well-being, be, be bound together, uni, unified. Thank you, Teresa. What a beautiful way to start this uh, conversation we're doing. So Teresa and I are hosting today's session. Um, I'm going to start. I'll introduce myself. Teresa will introduce herself later as she introduces Rangi Marie. Um, so my name is Lina Green, and I'm speaking to you from the land of the Ohlone people in Cupertino, California. I'm the CEO and founder of Angels of Impact, based in Singapore, San Francisco, and New Zealand. It's an evergreen fund offering funding and technical assistance to women of color, led community-based enterprises overcoming systemic poverty. We support the missing middle funding gap that are too large for microfinance and yet too small for traditional impact investors. And we work to offer entrepreneur-friendly terms using restorative investing frameworks. So today's session, just to give you some context, is actually a continuation of the session Trees and I co-hosted at the last EHF Springboard event, and we called it then Rethinking Impact Investing. The truth is, impact investing is not enough to tackle social and environmental justice. It is definitely better than traditional finance, but it's not good enough. Its focus on do good, do well does not lead to systemic change needed for a truly just and regenerative economy. Often when we talk about regenerative tense, we do not include the justice and the social component to it. So today, interestingly, in S Social Venture Circle, Esther Park, who is the CEO of Sienega Capital, actually mentioned how regenerative agriculture has been practiced by indigenous communities for a long, long time, forever, right? But their approach is even deeper. In the US, Native communities call it kin-centric. And she even suggested we should be calling it relationship, relational uh, agriculture rather than just regenerative agriculture. The Monitor Group report from Blueprint to Scale called for philanthropy to be used for impact investing as they clearly showed that impact investors do not address systemic change, especially for social issues like poverty um, and environmental justice. In a Jedi Collaborative Conference I was involved in organizing last year, Rodney Foxworth from Common Future said, the system of finance has an intentional design to keep marginalized communities down and extract from them. So we need to really recognize this. The system is clearly not broke. It is rigged, it's fixed to benefit the few at the expense of people and planet. And until we recognize that we cannot use the same system that created the problems to solve them as well, we will never make the necessary systems change. Good intentions alone are not enough. After all, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I first heard restorative financing from Rodney a few years back, and he attributed restorative economics to Nomako Akbo. She is really the mother of this groundbreaking thinking in the United States. And her work in this space is so groundbreaking that recently she was approached to be the CEO of a restorative finance fund founded by a newly inherited third generation uh, wealthy person under the Katali Foundation, and she can tell you more about it. With restorative investing, we're not just talking about moving funds to marginalized communities. We're looking deeper. We're looking at the implicit biases as to who gets invested into, how we invest into communities, the terms in which we invest, are they extractive? And even impact metrics, who determines it? The investors or the ones with the lived experience, right? Common Future and Racial Equity Lab has actually presented some frameworks around racial equity investing, which I really recommend that you look at. Recently, I had the fortune to meet Rangi Maria Price at an impact investing conference organized by Stephen Moy, an EHF fellow, and found out about models developed here in New Zealand based on Maori values and wisdom, tikanga-led investing. I began to see common threads in these new models and wanted to link these conversations so we can learn and innovate together. This is really an opportunity for New Zealand to reimagine investing and not just import the traditional impact investing of do good, do well. We can build 
a just and regenerative model for a better world. So today we will start the panel with Nomako Akbo, who, as I said earlier, I call the mother of restorative economics. Nomaka is the CEO of the Katali Foundation and the Restorative Economics Fund with a background in community organizing, electoral campaigns, policy and advocacy work on racial, social and environmental justice. And Nomaka is deeply committed in supporting projects that build resilient, healthy and self-determined communities rooted in shared prosperity. Nomaka provided technical assistance and strategic guidance to community owned governed community wealth being initiatives such as Restore Oakland, Black Land and Power and others. And she has also advised institutions such as the San Francisco Foundation, and most of you know, RSF Social Finance. Noamaka, the floor is all yours. Thank you always for the warmest um, welcomes and introductions, Lina. It's always a, a pleasure to be invited to share um, a little bit of, about my work and how um, I approach the opportunity um, that we're in now um, as a collective humanity. And so um, what I would like to say by ways of introductions as I set up my screen share um, is that while um, this is a very international space, which I'm very excited to see and I look forward to participating in the breakout groups, where we'll start to actually see what are the commonalities and threads um, between what I'll present and what we'll have the pleasure of listening to um, Ringa Marie present. Um, my work and the framework is very much informed by my experience in the global North in the United States um, and as a person who identifies as a black female a daughter of immigrants. And so just want to invite people to think about um, as I'm going through my piece, what are the frameworks um, and principles of the work that may align with you, your lived experience your community, even if the specific language that I use does not. Um, and so just wanted to kind of preface that because I always try to be mindful about um, language um, and how some of the content um, gets translated across communities. Um, but um, as Lina said, um, I come to this work as somebody who has been deeply rooted in community organizing in electoral politics and um, also in working on policy. And so I found my way to the field of impact investing um, as somebody who was really trying to understand less about the investment side and more about the impact side. How do we actually look to redistribute wealth and resources um, between communities um, in a way that helps to actually create more equity and more justice for all? And so I um, just wanted to kind of also lift that up that my work is very much focused in on how are we creating material outcomes for those that have been most historically impacted and on the ground. And so to kind of um, jump into it, I think I always try to invite people to sit with an understanding of how we come to understand economy and economy being kind of the meta ways that we also then think about investments in the terms under which we invest. And so much of what I learned when I went back to graduate school is that when we're looking to kind of define the word economy and um, have an understanding around what is happening in the performance of our economy, we're looking at metrics like supply and demand. We're using words like elasticity. We're very much focused in on the import and export, right? And so we're talking about the things that are focused in on the dollars and cents, but these things don't necessarily speak to the lived experience of the majority of people, um, nor do they fully recognize how you can have um, the cognitive dissonance of numbers performing well, but people having a poor quality of life. And so all this to say, when we take a moment to remind ourselves, what is the root meaning of the word economy, um, an organization that I always, I can never think enough for um, reminding me of this movement generation, um, always calls us into remembering that the Greek meaning of the word economy is the management of home. And so when I think about my home, I'm actually not thinking about dollars and cents. I'm not thinking about GDP. I'm actually thinking about my cultures, my traditions, what it meant to be raised by the daughter of Nigerian immigrants. I'm thinking about what does it look like to create safe and sacred space. And so there's an opportunity for us to start to have a different worldview, a different lens under which we come to understand economy, and one in which we're looking at the meaning of the word in terms of what is our collective home and how do we actually think about um, moving resources in a way that it lends us to the management of our collective home, creating that safe and sacred space for all people. 
And so in knowing that, I think one of the things that we're all too familiar with when it comes to traditional economic models is that typically when investors, developers, financiers seek to invest resources into a community, into a project, those individuals who are oftentimes um, the decision makers sit outside of the community that stands to be most directly impacted um, by that specific project, right? So whether that is moving money to a specific enterprise, whether that is putting resources into a community development project, oftentimes those people that have the resources don't come from that community. And so they are only engaging with the positive externalities of the project, um, i.e. the financial returns. Meanwhile, we know that those that live there are the ones that are directly impacted by what does it mean to have noise pollution? What does it mean to have um, your streets closed down while development is happening? And so I think the opportunity, again, if we want to continue to shift our world lens and how we think about this work, is to really figure out how are we moving resources and how are we investing in projects that are ensuring that those that stand to be most directly impacted are also the decision makers. This is also a way that we start to manage the power and privilege that investors oftentimes can wield over vulnerable communities that do need that deep investment, but are not invited into the table to be a part of making the shared decisions around what that investment is, what it looks like, and how that community is being resourced and built out. And so we have an opportunity to really think about how do we start to pivot from an economy, right? That old paradigm that's very much rooted in extraction of natural resources, accumulation of wealth and land, exclusion from certain communities, particularly black and brown and um, immigrant and indigenous communities um, in the case of the United States. Um, how do we think about transitioning from those old values, those old ways um, of our economic system and model and starting to move towards the values that we started to lift up, right? So when Lina talks about regeneration and how we think about not just regeneration in terms of agriculture, but also relational giving, what does it look like to move from extraction towards something that is relational and rooted in reciprocity? What does it look like to not just have investors and developers wielding the control over a particular project, but actually coming together with community to make decisions together so you're actually governing for the greater good? How do we start to actually build up models of shared prosperity that are deeply committed and invested in the well being of all people and not just the wealth accumulation and the financial returns back to the investors? And so, when we start to bring together these various values and practice, we have an opportunity to figure out when these things are all intersected, we can start to figure out how we can create an economy or a transition point in which we start to move out of uh, an economy of extraction and exploitation and towards something that's rooted in more shared prosperity and generosity. And that's where the heart of my work sits. And so in the context of my work, Restorative Economics, um, I would lift up that um, it's very much rooted in the recognition that in the specific instance of the United States, and I would offer a global capitalist economy around the world, we can see the ways that Black, Brown, Indigenous communities and communities of color have been extracted from, exploited from, making it possible for a white wealthy ruling class to attain and maintain and increase their wealth over a period of time. And so as we are seeing um, uprisings um, around the world, and as we see people and landless, pe um, landless groups pushing back and demanding equity and change, there's an opportunity to figure out how do we intentionally reinvest resources across the capital spectrum. So in the case of my work where um, I currently sit with the foundation, Tali Foundation, how do we start to look at not just the grant capital, but also the non-extractive investments that we can start to put into community wealth building projects by those same communities that have been historically impacted and making it possible for them to have the resources that they need to not only repair and heal themselves, but to then be a part of the shared decisions in terms of how we want to transform our economy going forward. And so my work with restorative economics, I see it as a transition point. I see it as an opportunity to set a guide, a framework to help us be disciplined and mindful about who we are investing resources, once again, those communities that have been most extracted from hurt and harmed, how we go about moving those resources, right? So being in just and right relationship and being in culturally appropriate relationships with these communities um, that inform how we move capital. And then 
what we are resourcing, really lifting up those projects that are deeply committed at getting at the root causes of what it means to build shared prosperity and community wealth, in which we're looking at the needs of a whole community, rather than only looking at privileging returns to an investor or a sole entrepreneur. And so the heart of the work that I do is rooted in a theory of liberation and one in which I look at supporting projects that are community owned or community stewarded. Projects that are coming together where people are collectively owning and managing land and assets together. And one of the things Lina mentioned as she was doing her work is that the more we try to figure out how we transfer our economy, the more we come back to understanding that we're returning back to the traditional wisdoms and practices of immigrant and indigenous communities. And so the notion of community stewardship, whether it comes to land, whether it comes to um, buildings and other assets is not new. However, we need to be intentional about now leveraging the legal mechanisms, the entities that make it possible to ensure that these same communities who are collectively owning assets um, have um, the, the, the title and claim to protect and defend those assets together. So really figuring out how people are owning projects um, and initiatives collectively together that start to move away from um, individual riches and towards that shared prosperity model once again. And that within that, governance is a key piece of, key piece of the success of the work really figuring out how we're also supporting these communities, these projects, and having shared decision-making power together over how they then manage and steward that land, that loan fund, and or that enterprise. Our ability to come together and make decisions where we're thinking about what is the what is the important need of the greater good and not just how does this benefit the corporation or the entrepreneur themselves as part of the transformation we're trying to facilitate through this theory of liberation. And that knowing that at the end of the day, while we're entering this conversation through an economic lens, through a lens of understanding how we move and invest capital and resources, this work is also about ensuring that the communities are able to then leverage the economic foundation that they've created through these community owned and governed projects so that they can also assert their cultural and political power as well. So recognizing that power sits in three different realms and not just the economic piece as well. I always invite projects that kind of reach out to us for funding. I both want to know how is your project being community owned and governed, but I also wanna know how is your project rooted and building power and creating systemic changes for those communities that have been most directly impacted. Um, really recognizing that we have to change the systems that are rooted in structural inequities and systemic racism if we actually want to create um, a more equitable world going forward. I'm gonna move through our next pieces really quickly just to make sure I don't go over um, time. Um, and so the, to kind of just break down the framework, the first piece is really recognizing that we need to be in an intentional um, disruption of the habits and patterns of our old economy. So the ways in which we are, we don't think twice about requesting market rate returns, or we don't think twice about um, putting collateral on an investment, being able to be in a moment of pause where we start to figure out where are the places that we can have interventions that are systemically different that allow us to actually move towards our values of regeneration and repair and not to just continue to double down on practices that lead to extraction and exploitation. And it's actually that place of being in a choice point where we start to identify the embodied practices that we can build into our institutions, that we can build into the ways that we move resources and capital so that we're not only changing um, the flow of resources um, outside of our funds, we're changing ourselves as individuals in terms of how we engage in the conversations and therefore also being able to change the cultural and structural systems as well that also shape the ways that we've created a global economy that has created um, so much disparity between the haves and have nots. And so our ability to shift our culture around how we move resources and do investing is really essential to informing who we invest in and how we go about doing it. And then once again, the piece of governance, the ability to recognize that there are some that stand to be disproportionately impacted by a particular investment, whether that's the, the neighborhood community of where a corporation may be operating, whether that's the workers um, that are employed by that business, um, or whether it's those that live alongside um, 
uh, the other decisions that are happening in the community planning process, recognizing that our ability to identify who stands to be most impacted and who is already most vulnerable and how do we center their needs, their voices and their interests and in informing how we make decisions for the community as a whole and recognizing that when we can center the needs, voices and interests of those that are most impacted, we get to more generative governance decisions that allow us to ensure that not only are we supporting that impacted population, but by doing so, those that are in proximity to them, their friends, their family, their children, also stand to be better off. And so how do we start to think about recalibrating the ways that we make decisions so that we're having a proportionate impact um, on those that actually need to be brought, brought up to part and have equity so that they can be a part of how we're transforming our economy going forward. And that within all of this, collaborative governance is key. Um, collaborative governance being having the capacity to engage in conversations where we're bringing together a multitude of stakeholders from a number of different sectors to both collaborate, to co-define what the problem is, to figure out what the process is to really fix that problem, and then to create solutions and move forward with actions together. But so far, we have not actually had the practices um, as a society to be in this type of um, engagement together. Because once again, we have the investors, the decision makers that sit outside of the community. And so we have to develop our capacity to be in collaborative governance together with the deep understanding that when we do so, we get closer to addressing the root causes of what's needed to actually create equity going forward. Um, and then lastly, once again, this work is about building power, understanding that when and how we move resources to a particular community or project, the economic power, it then makes it possible for that community and or project to assert and defend their values, their norms, their ways of wanting to be in relationship with one another. And it also makes it possible for us to contest for political power, recognizing that if a community has access to an economic base, they can not only leverage their assets to help to push policy and elect individuals um, that really speak to their values, um, their needs as a community, but then you're also able to um, defend your wins by ensuring that they get memorialized through the policies and legislations that are also passed. So recognizing that our work um, as we move money is to not just redistribute the wealth, but always be sure that we're leveraging our power as well to support those communities um, that we're deeply committed to. And so I always try to remind people that as we're moving from extraction and accumulation and towards regeneration and redistribution, that this work is about redistributing power, ensuring that those that have been most historically impacted, disenfranchised, and extracted from are able to build their power um, so that they can defend their ability to live life on their terms and to exercise self-determination. And so in the US particularly, we're really clear that the social movements, those organizations that are helping us to contest for power, be it groups like Black Lives Matter, be it on um, the fight for indigenous people's movements rights, particularly around the development of oil pipelines, um, or even the ways that immigrants um, are fighting for the right and dignity to actually get asylum in the United States that those social movements that are continuing to contest for power, that are on the front lines of challenging our policies and our systems are what then make it possible for us as those that move resources to start to move resources in different ways. When we have social movements that are calling into question that the very systems that we seek to change is those social movements that we need to reinvest in because they, they make an opening for us to then come in and move resources towards the types of projects that they're trying to lift up. And so once again, this work is about recognizing that in addition to moving um, redistributing wealth and redistributing power, that the racial wealth divide, particularly as we see it in the US, is not just a capital gap. It's a gap in access to skills, resources, networks, um, and knowledge. And so we also have to move our resources in a way that it builds the human development and the capacity of communities to even be able to engage in these conversations and take on these projects in the first place. We also, once again, know that this work is not just about creating something new. 
we actually get to lift up, celebrate, honor, recognize, and support those indigenous cultures, our traditions, our collective wisdom um, as a community as a whole and figure out how we actually take some of those practices that we have seen um, communities hold on to and how can it start to shape our rethinking and the ways that we move resources um, as investors um, and as philanthropic um, institutions. And by doing so, we get to start to create a community of practice where we're starting to build out the legal providers, the technical assistance providers that really make it possible for us to create a social movement infrastructure that's deeply committed to impact over returns. And so this just kind of, it's a lot of words that highlights everything that I just kind of took us through, moving non-extractive regenerative capital, being able to lift up models for community governance, and always identifying those values aligned technical assistance providers that we also know make it possible for these projects to go from vision to implementation. And so this is the work that I have the pleasure of doing at the Katali Foundation. We do have a $300 million integrated capital vehicle based off of this framework. It's called the Restorative Economies Fund. We also have two other grant making entities, one focused in on environmental justice work. Um, and then we also have a grant making entity focused in on the mindfulness and healing justice practices. Um, and so happy to kind of go into our breakout sessions later and share a little bit about the work that we have the pleasure of doing with Tali Foundation. Um, and I know my colleague Lena Shalabi is on the line as well. So Lena, if you want to drop a little chat, um, hello in the chat box, people can also reach out to you as well. But thank you so much, Elena. I'll stop my screen share now. Thank you so much, Nomako. That was really a wealth of information there. Thank you. And um, at, the, at the end, I think one of the key takeaways I had was the intentionality that you brought in about recognizing existing studies and having an intentionality to shift not just wealth, but also power. And you also talked about the intermediaries with the lived experience. And I just wanted to acknowledge that we actually have uh, Nikki from NDN Collective with us and Jamie from Native Women Lead, uh, who are also trailblazing uh, in the United States and many others. I see Anita Sanchez here as well. Um, so thank you. With that, I'm gonna pass it to Teresa to take us through the next part of the session. Uh, he uri tēnei nō te tai tokarau i te tātoku pāpā nō Ngātika ki Whangaroa i te tātoku māma nō Hokianga Hakapau Karakia ko Teresa Tiffin Ashton tōku ingwa. So I'm just sharing with you that I hail from the far north. On my father's side, I'm from the east coast and my mother's side from the west coast. Two beautiful places to be. However, I'm currently in Auckland and um, it's lovely to be here with you all. So really, I'm setting the scene for here in New Zealand, and I'm going to share with you this, you know, the statistics that remind us why systemic change is required, and also the importance of innovative restorative models for change. And if I start with our demography, you know, Māori actually make up 16% of the Māori population, of which Wahine Māori females make up 51%, not enough males around for us. Um, our population is youth, youthful, and in 2015, statistics showed that more than 11% of Māori were aged 5 to 9 years, compared to around 6% for non-Māori. And 34% are under the age of 15 years, making the medium age around 24. And this demography is totally different to non-Māori. And when we're thinking of demography solutions, we, we, we need to, um, you know, really figure out the other end of the scale um, if, if Māori are actually more youthful. And, um, and also by 2030, Māori, the Māori population is, is likely to grow by 16%, slightly faster than non-Māori. And I mention this because it means that the youth of, of, of today are who we will rely on when we retire. And so unless we are propping them up and getting our, you know, the right systems in place to nurture them, to grow them, we are all staffed, you know, basically. It doesn't just affect Māori, it affects all of us. So Māori are less advantaged um, uh, compared to non-Māori across all socio-economic indicators. In fact, Māori adults have lower rate, rates of uh, school completion and higher rates of unemployment and it absolutely exacerbated during COVID and affecting predominantly women. 
more Māori than non-Māori have a personal income less than $10,000 and receive income support. Māori are more likely to live in a household that has no heating, no phone, no internet or even have a car. Māori, um, more Māori live in rental properties and crowded households, although I have to say that it's part of our social construct to, have, to live with three generations. And so to us, it's not overcrowding, it's our, it's, our, it's our social construct. And so the houses just have to be bigger to accommodate us. Um, Namaka mentioned about the racial discrimination. So over time, Māori adults aged 15 and over are more likely to report experience, experiencing racial discrimination, including experiencing any type of ethnically motivated attacks, whether it's physical or verbal, and experiencing any unfair treatment on the, on the basis of ethnicity and health, housing and work situations. As a last resort lender, Māori Women's Development have the opportunity to access applications for funding and these systemic issues are prevalent. However, the key component that we see really around business is lack of education or knowledge on how to start and run a business. The biggest gaps we find are knowledge around financial management, marketing and validation of either your product or your service. What we question though are the 10% decline that can't be explained, which is why we have a wraparound support system prior to and post funding. And you know, another um, great thing is that luckily EWI settlements are starting to level the playing ground. However, however, it's still a long way to go. But e enabling EWI to fulfill their own te rangi te rataro, which is self-governance, um, you know, we, we had the opportunity to develop our own powerhouses within our own con uh, communities, with and for communities. Uh, and of course, when we develop our, our communities, we're looking at all the corners of social, environmental and economic solutions, while also contributing to the New Zealand and global economy. So we're not just playing in our own circles, we're playing in the wider circles. We contribute in a big way, particularly in the primary industries. And um, so, you know, I just wanted to set the scene so that it really opens it up for um, Marangi Māori now to um, really show models that are, are successful. However, there's still not enough, I have to say. We have to be very innovative. We have to be clear and, and intentional, as Namaka said, around uh, the solutions we want to achieve. Now, it's my lovely pleasure to introduce Rangi Māori, who's a great friend of mine. In fact, we met in 2006 when we both did the Leadership New Zealand program and of whom we were both alumna. Um, and so I'm, um, it's lovely to introduce her. So Rangi Māori is actually the CEO, was the CEO of, of Te Pai Roa Tika or Te Tai Tukaro, transforming Tai Tukaro for good until May 2020. Rangi Māori oversaw the design an establishment of a self-sustained uh, investment platform to deliver long-term, large-scale, high-impact investment for Tai Tokoro. And for someone who comes from Tai Tokoro, Rangi Māori has played a big role amongst all the major leaders in Tai Tokoro and to enable change. Prior to this, she was CEO of Amakura Iwi, um, Iwi Consortium, of which I was a member at the time, an entity created by the CEOs of Tai Tukuro, all the iwi. Um, and of course, now she's the principal of the Connective and Impact Enterprise Delivering Systemic Change, focused on developing and delivering world leading approaches for systemic impact. Kia koe rangi bari. Uh, thank you very much. Um, kia ora everyone. And um, I just want to uh, uplift both uh, what uh, Laina um, Noamaka and um, Teresa have spoken and thank them actually for the um, wonderful platform that it has created um, to enable um, me to share what we have been doing in Te Kaitokaro. I also want to um, welcome and um, acknowledge everyone that is on the call today. 
Bay um, from um, Te Tai Tokiro, or the northern part of the North Island. Um, so, uh, Heori Aho or um, Te Ati Haunui a Paparangi Whakatohi a Mingai Tai Ki Tōrere Korangi Māori e Tōku Ingo. So, I'm just making, um, identifying myself uh, according to the First Nations that I am a grandchild of. And um, it has been my personal privilege also to work um, with iwi, um, and those are our First Nations, um, and Te Tai Tokero for the last uh, 30 years, as it would be, as it happens to be. And so um, while I just uh, <clears throat> start to share what we've been talking about, the context for this is really um, on our based on our history and some of which um, Teresa has just recently uh, has just shared with you but um, our our nation is enjoying the second version of nationhood um, its first version was really when it was settled by um, First Nations um, who identify under uh, their various, um, their own names, but we are collectively known as Māori. And our second form of nationhood happened in the mid 1800s uh, and uh, allowed actually for, I guess, um, the promise was a more richer experience of both um, the goodness that is endemic in Aotearoa, New Zealand and to be able to share because we're really curious, um, we were really curious people anyway, um, just to share from other cultures um, and be able to experience the richness, richness that they would bring. And so that was the promise that started, um, I guess, uh, the first, second version of nationhood that we were enjoying. Um, history has shown however that that history has been a bit um our experience of that has been a bit pitted and i guess it's a legacy of a, a um of colonization and so what we have done here is that in the um in early 2010 2013 there was an opportunity that uh, settlement processes um, as a result of the grievances and the harm that had been done um, as a result of colonization meant that we had settlements or um, I don't know what, what you would call it. Um, it certainly isn't payment back, but just a way of, um, I guess, recompensing um, our people for the losses that they had suffered. And those provided Iwi in the North the opportunity, I guess, to take the lead in determining and um, investing in the economic well-being of their people based on how we define what is good for us. And um, in there we have a saying, te kohinga o te iho matua me te iho marie. And this is where um, we understand when we're engaging with all of the resources and our responsibilities that we have as Māori, that everything is interrelated, everything is interconnected, nothing exists in itself. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is really about a tikanga-led approach to the way that we invest our effort and our resources. And tikanga basically is a system of interconnected and interrelated values, principles, behaviours and actions um, and it is a lens through which Māori uh, see and interact with the world. Um, its genesis, and there is a hierarchy for that, starts in the spiritual world. It's connected with the universe and cosmology. It's connected with thought and philosophy. And then it manifests itself in, physical, in, in the physical realm. So it was important for us that if um, we are to be defining what success looks like, looks like for us, that we are looking at that through a tikanga lens. So tikanga for us matters. And here on the left-hand side, we have bubbles. Tangata means our people. Whenua is our planet. And oranga is how, how we um, use those sorts of resources in order to generate well-being. And so... The current model that we're operating under the uh, under at the moment is at the top there. We need to make money. And with whatever we have left over after we've made money, we'll do good. From a tikanga point of view, 
Tikanga is purpose and well-being driven, not profit driven. It focuses on upholding the well-being of people in the planet as being the determinants of how you would use capital and your best thinking to achieve those ends. So it starts with this. Uh, one of the other things that I want to talk about with our genealogy is that um, we call that whakapapa. And so you might hear me drop into that sort of language because I've got a, uh, uh, I'm operating in both worlds at the moment. So tikanga matters. And I'll just give you a brief explanation of what I mean. So inherently, um, what we believe as Māori people, that everything we are and everything that we have been given is divinely inspired. So that imposes upon us sacred obligations. On the left-hand side at the top there, we have a word there called manātanga. And that means that we have a sacred obligation to deeply care for people, people that are connected to us or people that come across our path or people to whom we would show hospitality. And then on the other side of that, we have a sacred obligation to care for the life supporting capacity of the planet in perpetuity. And in fact, for Māori people, we can actually whakapapa or trace our genesis too to elements in the environment. We are inseparable from them. And so what both those obligations impose upon us is um, the obligation to actually generate well-being in order to achieve both parts of those obligations, well-being for the environment and well-being for our people. And that is what the word heoranga means, is to prosper and to do well. And so sitting underneath that, there are also sacred values that we hold, starting from the left-hand side. We have tika. That means that what we do, we know inherently with honesty that it is the right thing to do. So what's the right thing to do? And in the middle, puno. What does wisdom tell us? What's, what is the truth? What's, what does integrity demand of us? And then on the right-hand side, we have aroha. And, and aroha is love. What does love require from us? So those are the sacred values that we will always uphold. Those never change. Everything above that line. But sitting underneath that, uh, we have, I guess, Māori best pra practice. So given that we're going to be applying tikanga to our, um, to our economic development, um, below that line, what you have is how we would craft what our best practice would look like. Mana means how do we exercise influence? How do we use our influence to affect systems change in terms of creating an environment, policy, legislative, and um, a strategic environment um, to, that enables our people to succeed? And then after that, fai puno. Every decision that we make needs to be based on really good evidence, including evidence from our own um, cultural intelligence around what is good for us and what is culturally credible. And then in the middle there, this is Mātauranga is about building the capability or providing the expertise for our people to be able to create meaningful and independent lives that are noble and honourable for them as they determine. And then whairawa. Whairawa is as iwi or as First Nations with the resources that we have in our hands, um, how do we use that to ensure that we can mobilise those resources so that our people and our lands prosper? And then on the far side there is that the fact that we're actually really relational and not transactional. So we would be looking to ensure that we actually work collaboratively with other organisations who are values aligned to advance the interests of our people. So that is our tikanga framework. And so what did we do? We applied that to some economic analysis that we did back in the time, which was in 2013. And what we have there is what it showed that the Taitokaro Māori economy looks like at that time. And what those statistics demonstrate is that we have a developing economy 
within a developed economy. And what that means is that we needed to have a policy um, environment that was tailored towards both parts of a developing and a developed economy. We needed to fix the fundamental, fundamentals. And what those statistics basically demonstrated is the accumulation of a number of things, uppermost being poor investment decisions, underinvestment, disinvestment, no investment and divestment across the spectrum of all of those institutions who are purportedly investing into Māori into their economic well-being. So we had to take charge of the conversations around investment coming into Māori and development into our region. And what we found is that it was really difficult to have those. There was just no meeting the minds. So we had to actually create our own investment platform, and that was Te Pairo Te Ko Te Taitokero, which is transforming Taitokero for good. And what we were finding, if you were um, based on the traditional investment models and the investment mindset um, that is still prevalent, is that um, investment would come into standard projects. They're good projects. Um, and they would, there would be some social or environmental return that might be a part of that. And it's primarily reliant upon grants and donations. And it was difficult to align those with other projects or entities. So often the impact was often limited. So if we go right to the far end of the spectrum there on the right hand side, a systems level project is actually what tikanga led investing looks like. This is us understanding the ecosystem and all of the interdependencies um, between um, a number of factors uh, so that we could actually, if we were to invest across a whole spectrum um, of projects and we understood what those interdependencies were, that we would actually get a greater level of system, a systems level return or a regenerative return. And it would often need to understand, um, start with an understanding of our system, which is what we did, and to understand where the best points were for us to intervene. It was really us taking a portfolio approach to the way that we were invest. And so what we were looking for too, is that our timeline or our horizons are intergenerational. So that we were looking for impact that is long-term and self-sustained. Between a standard way of investing and a Māori or a tikanga-led way of investing, other ways of investing, they're great. You've got impact, um, impact projects, a particular project that people would invest into, and they'd be looking for a social or um, an environmental return. That's a good thing. But it was, not, it was done in a silo and really wasn't looking at aligning with other um, projects or entities. So the impact is likely, but it was a lot more narrow. Well, you might have a number of projects that uh, are impact-based um, and they're looking to maximize value. But that value is usually just at a quite a discrete or at a local level. And what we were wanting is that this was something that was intergenerational, it was self-sustaining, so that would self-determination was a part of its characteristics and the returns that we would be looking for. Uh, and usually it means that the power would be returning to those communities. And so what we were looking for in terms of how we wanted to use capital is to use capital and have a different relationship with investment, um, different to what it is at the moment. But this is about capital being a force for good. It is a means and not an end. And so on the left-hand side, if we were looking at what tikanga-led impact investing or tikanga-led investing looks like, these are the sorts of components that we would be looking for in terms of any priority community or any priority that we were investing into. So on the left-hand side, self-determination versus servitude. This is about we and not about me. This is about what's done by the priority community and it's bespoke based on their lived experience, their determination of what good looks like for them and how they choose to measure it rather than being done to them and having a one-size-fits-all or a universal approach. We also take a holistic systems-level approach rather than a siloed 
poorly targeted, tinkering around the edges approach. We're looking at intergenerational horizons. We're looking for large scale impact rather than short term limited impact. We are always, if you go back to our values, looking to uphold people and the environment in the investment decisions that we make. We are not looking to commoditize them. Our footprint, our fingerprints should be regenerative, restorative and inclusive well-being rather than extractive, exploitive, mercenary, profiteering. We have our priority communities as being the owners and investors. And if they are the owners and investors, then they're definitely co-designing and co-leading it. Rather than them retaining the status of being constantly and um, generationally dependent and being the end users of services. The models that we use are defined by our tikanga, what our values say, and by our measures of success rather than the business as usual models. And um, Noamaka's um, slides alluded to those sorts of things in terms of GDP and things that we can measure and count rather than the things, than the things that actually count. And we're looking at crafting collaborative, high trust relationships rather than master servant, competitive relationships. We're not transactional. And so it's interesting, one would think that um, Mamaka and I were actually preparing our slides together, but we did this independent of each other. Really where the change sits is that this is actually about rebalancing and redistributing power, because the world is out of balance. Um, and if we talk about equity from a Māori point of view, we're talking about equilibrium. Um, so this is about who's wielding, who's building, and who's sharing power and where it actually ends up staying. And power, just to be really clear, is the ability to change the rules and to set the rules for the game. And as a final point, one of the things that I would like to say is that the world as we have created it is a process of our thinking. It cannot be changed without changing our thinking. And so we can do that by redistributing power so that the energy that we have control over is used to restore, regenerate, heal, share, to unlock potential that sits inside communities and the resources, particularly for those communities who have been marginalized and excluded. And so power, energy and potential are the final three points that we have that I want to um, uh, talk about from a Māori point of view. Those are what we're talking about when we say that we're talking about um, enhancing the mana, the modi, and the tapu of something. Those are the energies that exist in everything and everyone in the universe. I guess the non Māori equivalent would be to say that we're looking at being more moral and ethical in the way that we invest and we behave and we think. Kia ora, everyone. Thank you so much, my friend. Um, you know, and thank you for sharing our tikanga model as a decision-making process. I think one of the key things I got from this is how values is used as a barometer, you know, at the forefront of collaboration and decision-making. And I'm also grateful that when it comes to power, that you're using your, yours to make change to unlock the potentiality of our communities. Lorena he mihi, he mihi just um, you know, giving praise and thanks to Rangi Maria and us all.